mic or are we, are we using this oh, one? Oh, yeah, we're, oh, we're, God, we're, things yeah. have really we're changed since I last time. It upgrades each time. I noticed that. Yeah, I'm just I'm pleased by that because I saw previously you had the mic and I didn't like the idea of you having control. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> most <laughs> of the interviews I forget to put yeah, it across. Yeah. And I'm just, yeah, yeah. It's I'm a lot like, of, mm, how, yeah. how will I talk over Taylor yeah. if he's got the mic? <laughs> Chris Taylor here for BMT TV with an old familiar friend, you know him, I know him, as Craig Rucastle, host of season three of War on Waste, but more significantly for the BMT audience. How many BMT awards have we hosted I now? I actually don't know. I tried to think of that and I can't, I don't know. It's, it's at least double figures though. It's, it's past, because I remember when we got to the 10th one going, have they forgotten they can change hosts? And now we're well past that. It's all. It's got to the stage where I think yeah, it's too embarrassing to change. Like you can, after five years, you can sort of go, let's see what Charlie Pickering's up to. But now it's almost. It would be. I don't know. Yeah. It's a job for life. Exactly. And it's for context. The, the only reason we're talking about this is when you do these sorts of industry awards nights or any sort of corporate MC work, you never do it more than once. Like it's you, most people generally die or they just like to rotate people for a fresh perspective. It's very unusual to do it more than once. So well, it's the only gig yeah. we've ever done that's had repeat business. And what I like about it is because the first time we did that, they said, look, we're going to let you keep doing it until you get it right. And so we haven't got it right no. yet. So we just think. <laughs> There's years we've even tried to get out of it, like, from, like been so drunk. Like got every, you know how advertising agencies all have unpronounceable <clears throat> names and mm. weird combinations of letters. We've said everyone's name wrong. We've, we've skipped Taylor's awards. We still get invited back. Taylor's definitely burnt. Several of the sponsors over the years, we're still back. So anyway, it's good, to, good it's to be back. It's great to be here. <laughs> Promoted, in fact, to B and T TV. It's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, we've got you in to discuss the war on waste, which continues to be this great success story. It's, it's perfect timing because it's just finished going to air. So perfect promo. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Tails. <laughs> but we wouldn't want to waste the plug. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I ran the war on waste program just. As a plug for this being yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of the war great to have the ABC audience coming on board to hear about what the war and waste is about. On paper, the idea of one series about waste yeah. seems ambitious and brave. Three series back to back on the topic of waste. How were you confident from day one oh. that there was an audience for this? No, not at all. I mean I remember because because this was based on a British format originally, and they've done like one season and I thought this would be a pretty obscure show. Like, yeah. you know, it was a show about bins. I thought it would be very <laughs> obscure. And and it was at a time when all the other shows on TV were either renovation or cooking. Yeah. You know, they didn't show the bins. The whole the whole yeah. memo on the block is do not show the skips <laughs> yeah. on, on MasterChef. Do not show the waste. Exactly. You're going, no, wouldn't it be interesting to go into the waste part of this process? Yeah, totally. And look, we were shocked. We were surprised by, A, how many people watched the first series. I think it was like, one of the highest rating shows on the ABC that year. How many, also the thing like it was unintentional, but how much was watched in schools for years afterwards and that kind of thing. And I think, interestingly enough, just because it's got a little bit of comedy in it, just because it's, you know, by background, it kind of works better in schools. So that was amazing. And then just to be actually see the kind of long-term effects and people kind of campaigning against for change to governments, and that's been amazing. So no, I look... A, a second one was a total shock. A third one, again, a miracle. Fourth one, don't bother. I, mean, I know. I, I think I, I think the horse is bold. But yeah. then, um, it's was it something you thought much about before you'd been approached to host? It's the interesting because I, I personally, in my own life, back in those days, I was much more climate interested. So, like you know, soul, all that kind of stuff, interested me. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought of myself as being a spokesperson for it. You know, I occasionally try and do a segment if it fitted yeah. into a show. I would have considered myself to be, a, you know, a great recycler and into that kind of thing, but I definitely didn't ex consider myself an expert. And I think, ironically, that kind of helped, helped. the show because you don't I, was going as, as an expert, no, no. I was going You're on a learning, similar journey yeah, yeah. to the actual audience. Um, and that's what, like, even to this day, like, I will sit there for weeks just going, what is the goddamn answer to this question? And still knocking my head against the wall and kind of going, oh, just why, why don't we do this better? And, you know, that's where it kind of still goes. The thing I've always wanted to know is, like, is it, has it made your life a nightmare? Like, everywhere you go now, like, if you go to Coles or Woolies, have you got to be so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, can you not be photographed near a bottled 
plastic bottled water? <laughs> have you always got to have the keep cup at the cafe? Like, oh, look, how how much do, do the members of the public sort of keep you on your toes about? Well, it's, it's not really that it's a nightmare. Like, with a lot of those things, they're just simple behaviour changes. And once you get used to them, like, I think I've had like one disposable coffee cup in six or seven years, and that was including COVID. But it's just because you've kind of changed your habits and you're used to it. Like, in the same way that you remember to take your phone, like, I'll think, oh, how have I got my bottle? That kind of thing. But look, I, the interesting thing about that is I often get people come up to me and go, oh, no, oh, sorry, I haven't got my, my you know, reusable cup. And it's like, the <laughs> as actual, if you're the police. <coughs> yeah, yeah, as if yeah, I'm yeah. the police. But it's also interesting because the whole point of the show is that we try not to be viciously judgmental about that kind of stuff. I actually think that there's often too much judgmentalism in environmental dialogue and discussion. And I think that's a bad thing. I actually think that... that <clears throat> Recognising that people will make mistakes is is a part of it, mm. and it's actually more important to go. Yeah, I know you forgot, but you know it's that you're trying most of the time. That's the most important thing. So I'm, I don't, I'm not per- perfect at it. Neither should anyone else be. It's not the point. Phew. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so from seasons one to three, have you observed societal improvements in this space, or have we gone backwards in some areas, or are we getting better? What, what's your it, read? It's frustrating in a way. Like just, so there's definitely been improvements. So it was interesting looking back for this third season, looking back at what we were kind of looking at in the first season, and kind of going, okay, container deposit, like your 10 cent, you know, 10 cent return on, on your cans and your bottles and that, is pretty much around the country now. You've had single-use plastic bans that have been quite effective now. Studies show that over 80% of people will remember to take their shopping bags, which I never would have predicted that level. That's a huge behaviour yeah. change for a country. We've got single-use plastic bans. There's been uh, food recycling is becoming a lot more mainstream and happening in a lot of councils. So there's been lots of positive change. A lot of areas, though, where you kind of go, oh, shit, it's got worse. Fashion is right. one of the interesting ones where I think we've kind fast of... Fast fashion. Fast fashion has got even faster. Yeah. And you yeah. feel like we're kind of going backwards even more. So, look, it's a, it's not a simple thing. It's, and again, it's funny because people want black or white answers, right? You kind of have people who are like, everything gets recycled. And then people who, if they see one bad story about, you know, a truck picking up the wrong thing, they'll go, nothing gets recycled. Yes. You kind of go, war and waste kind of has to be in the middle. And go, look, the reality is this stuff gets recycled this stuff doesn't, this isn't getting recycled because it's been designed badly, we should change that, you know. It's just kind of, it's a bit more complex, it's a bit more grey. You mentioned earlier, you thought one of the reasons kids particularly really got into it is because there's a lot of comedy. Like, it's it's not an earnest series and it doesn't beat you over the head with sort of moralising or... Well, a little in, bit. With, <laughs> with instructional how-tos. It's yeah. sort of, it's done with a, a light charm and, and joke. To what extent generally do you think using comedy is really useful when dealing with difficult issues like waste, like the environment? It's interesting because I wouldn't think we, I don't think we use a lot of comedy. Like it's funny because it's coming from our background, right? I mean, when I saw it, because it's the least funny thing I've ever done in my life. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I've normally rely on your writing tales, that's right. <laughs> but you know, but in the doco world, it, it seems yes. kind of a funny example from that. I think it's useful at times. Like it's, Sometimes it can get in the way. It was really interesting directing the, the, the big deal democracy of Christian Van Buren. Christian, Christian is such a kind of great com- comedy person. Um, so naturally the two of us, we kind of put in these scenes. And in the edit suite, we stripped out a lot of the comedic scenes because it kind of really got in the way of the story or it just took away from the mood that you were kind of building in that. So I think it can work at times. I think where it was really useful is when you're kind of trying to communicate something really complex. Like yeah. so. There's so many complex things in our world today. Climate change is an example of that. Where I think sometimes comedy or humour can really help just step people through that stuff that's really complex and nightmarish. Uh, B&C TV obviously has a, a big audience within the advertising sector and the marketing sector. How, what's your take on how they engage with these ideas? Do you think they could afford to try some more entertaining approaches? How, what's your I mean, read I, on how... I think... I think, I think Advertisers use comedy really effectively. I think great examples of that. I think when it comes to climate change and waste and that, I would say that it's a really interesting challenge for the advertising industry at the moment. I know there's the kind of climate comms organisation trying to start that conversation with advertisers about, hey, we probably shouldn't be doing these ads that are promoting the down destruction of our future. I mean, you know, I don't know, whoever did the Glencore ad out there, very funny stuff. You know, <laughs> you know, it's for, for all of us. Like it's just like whatever the tag is, it's just like. 
Yeah, you know, people making Glencore look like they're fantastic by ignoring all of their coal and gas right. and petrol and everything else is just <clears throat> terrible advertising. There is a lot of greenwashing out there too. Not always intentional. I think sometimes people are well in, in, intended in it. Uh, yeah, but I think, just, yeah. Can we drill down on that? Because I find this really interesting. There's sort of a lot of the corporate sector has got very, you know, sort of very attuned with sort of the woke values and what the socially progressive values are. And they're quite, and greenwashing is one of them. They sort of know what they should be doing. Um, without really making any systemic change. Have you, do you think that's a fair exertion? Look, it is hard at times, particularly, and it's going to be a big issue coming forward because a lot of companies have net zero kind of targets, net zero by 2050, right? <clears throat> and they're going to be saying, hey, we're net zero now. And they've actually, in the UK, they've banned certain advertising about this because in a lot of cases, it's bullshit. Um, it's a tough one because sometimes I'll see examples where a company will change what they're doing and promote that. And it'll be called greenwashing by a certain sector. And I'm kind of sitting in the middle going, look, it kind of is, but it is actually that ironically from their perspective, they actually think they've done a great thing. So they've done change. So I actually like things. So right now you'll see the Coca-Cola ads that talk up the fact that all of their small print under 600 mils and 600 mils and under all of their kind of plastic packaging is 100% recycled now. I like seeing that because it shows that A, it? there's a pressure there to, to do it they are actually doing it. And the fact they're promoting that shows that there is a desire in, a, in the community for change to happen in that area. But what's the sort of, what's the marketing mindset? Why do they need to promote that side of their Well, that's product? the question. I mean, that's, that shows... Because like, Coca-Cola is still a soft drink. You could just sell the lifestyle, sell the flavour. But that's the thing. The it, fact that they'd shoot, they must think there's sales yeah. in promoting the, the corporate credentials and the environmental credentials of the company. I think they get a lot of pushback from the community about the fact that the you know if you look at litter in the world, if you look at kind of if you look at litter in your parks or in the ocean or that, a lot of it will be those bottles and that. And they are getting a lot of feedback about that. There's a lot of people who attack them about that. Um, so they do respond to that. And as I said, that line between what's greenwashing and what's not is a difficult one sometimes yeah. because you've got to You've got to sometimes make go, okay, are they on a journey where they are actually going the right direction? Or is this just a little bit of bullshit they think we can get people off yes. our back and then go back to this, doing the way we have always done it? And that's the real difficult thing. And, and I guess there's, good, the there's examples where people get that balance right and, and examples where they yeah. are clearly very cynical about there, it. There are some people, I think there are some companies who are actually trying to do the right thing in some of these spaces. Interestingly enough, after the first war on waste, one of the things that surprised me, you know, I came back from a kind of government perspective at uni, studying politics and that, I was surprised by how often companies were more responsive than sometimes politicians. That surprised yes. me. It was like yeah. they're actually a bit more nervy about the community than politicians. Now, politicians are actually quite used to people hating yes. them. They're like, yeah. ah, yeah. thick skin, I don't give a shit. Yeah. Corporations were sometimes a little bit more responsive, actually, and that surprised me. We're seeing that at the moment with the voice referendum a bit. Like, corporations taking a very clear stand in a way that some politicians are still being a bit... Guard some politicians, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, some politicians are just doing it for their own self-interest, yes. Uh, but yeah, no, it is interesting. So it's 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 a kind of complex one, and I, yeah, I'm. There's a lot of greenwashing out there, but there's also are companies that are trying to do the right thing, and distinguishing between the two can be very hard. Any more environmental documentaries on the horizon for you? <clears throat> um, I hope so. I've, I'm kind of, I'm really tossing around in my mind some of the climate stuff. There's some really interesting questions there. And again, it's that question of finding the right stories or the right way to present it. I'm, I'm very wary of like, I don't want to do, so, you know, I think we've come a long way. Like I even look back at when we did Fight for Planet A, which I think went out in 2019. The conversation then to what it is now, I feel like it's substantially changed. I actually feel like some of the stuff we put in Fight for Planet A is we, when we talk to people on the streets, we're like, people just fundamentally don't even understand the basics of what this is. Some of that feels like it's kind of old. So I think the conversation's come along. But it is that question of kind of looking at, it's, I guess it's what Democracy for Sale looked at, was like money and politics and all that kind of stuff. Because what's that kind of deeper stuff that when you have polling saying 70 or 80% want to change, why does it not happen? You're going to go, okay, there's deeper structural things here. The question is how do you take that and 
make it interesting and it's not always easy so right yeah i've tried to make this interview interesting oh you failed. failed you failed, um, you failed. Um, <laughs> but i look forward to co-hosting the bnt awards with you maybe i don't know we haven't been asked yet but uh if we are there i have been uh, all right <laughs> i've asked me to get a co-host it's, it's right in if you think you're better than taylor it'll be craig rewcastle and greta thunberg this year the the environmental double act you've been asking for craig thank you so much for joining us on bnt tv thanks chris